Hi everyone, Dr. DeFelice here, and today I'm going to give you some idea of how to critically appraise a journal article. This one is, uh, the topic is a therapy question, um, and it is a randomized control trial. So here we go. So like I said, we are going to be doing a critical appraisal of a journal article on a therapy. Um, this is really kind of a demonstration of how to use evidence-based practice to really critically appraise a research study. Um, so here we go. First of all, just to get us all on the same page, what is therapy? Well, a therapy can be many things. It can be a medication. It can be surgery or a procedure physical therapy, occupational therapy, talk therapy. And usually when we're assessing a type of therapy or a type of treatment for its effectiveness, we would do this by doing a randomized controlled trial. So the process of a randomized controlled trial is just that basic experimental design. You have a randomly selected sample population um, and you randomly assign them to different groups. Uh, in this case, we have two groups. We have our group one, which is getting the treatment, and group two would either um, get the control treatment, they would be the controls to compare the new treatment to the control treatment or the standard of care. And we would be looking at the outcomes and comparing the differences between the two groups of study participants. We do want to remember our risk of bias pyramid. Um, so remember that risk of bias is risk that a study design does not accurately reflect the truth. Um, in our risk of bias pyramid, the risk of bias goes down as you move up the pyramid. So you can see up here, randomized controlled double blind studies are tippy topping of the pyramid. Um, on top of that, though, would be like systematic reviews and meta analyses of randomized controlled double blind studies. Um, but either way, randomized controlled studies um, are pretty much to the top side of the pyramid, so that tells us that the risk of bias is pretty low to begin with, um, as long as the study design is good. So if we have a, uh, a patient that has a problem, this is our clinical scenario. We have a 62-year-old man with a disease called peripheral artery disease, and he comes into the office. Um, and he has had treatment. He's got the standard of care treatment, but he's still reporting difficulty walking without leg pain for more than two minutes. Um, and he says that his quality of life is substantially impaired. And he wants to know if there's anything that can be done to help alleviate his leg pain with walking. And so this is something that we see with patients with peripheral artery disease often. It's called intermittent claudication, where they get leg pain um, with physical exertion. So we do have a PICO question to be formed if we want to look up some research on how we can help our patient. So our PICO question, remember the P stands for patient, the I stands for intervention or exposure, the C stands for comparison intervention or exposure, the O is the outcome. And for our case right now, the T is going to be the type of clinical question being considered. And right now we are talking about a therapy question. Sometimes you'll see the T stand for time, um, but in this case, it will stand for the type of clinical question being considered. So I'd like you to take a second and form your PICO question. So this is what we have. We have P, our patient, is a 62-year-old man with peripheral artery disease and leg pain while walking. The intervention or exposure, well, this is what we're looking to find out. We want to know if there's something out there that we can um, offer this gentleman to help him with his leg pain. Our comparison is the standard treatment. Uh, the outcome is decreased leg pain with walking, and like I said, the type of clinical question being considered is therapy. So this is the time when we would search our PICO question. And so we take little bits of the important information and we plug it into the search bar. We can plug it into PubMed. In this case, I plugged it into the Journal of the American Medical Association, and I got this article. The effect of a home-based walking exercise behavior change intervention versus usual care on walking in adults with peripheral artery disease. Um, and this uh, showed up in JAMA in 2022. So this is where evidence-based practice comes in. We are looking at assessing 
the article for, for its strength and for its validity, for its risk of bias, for we want to look at the results. We want to see, was there an effect of this new treatment? Um, and we want to see whether this, uh, what they found in this journal article could be applicable to our patient. So the first thing we do is we assess the article for validity or for risk of bias. And just um, as a reminder, validity asks the question, what is the risk of bias? And so we check um, whether or not something is accurately reflecting the truth of the situation. And there are two types of validity. There is internal validity. And so that is answering the question, did the study um, answer the question that it set out to initially answer? Um, so that would be internal validity. And then we have external validity, which is generalizability. And that's the likelihood that the results of a study with internal validity can be generalized to other populations, places, and or times. So we have these questions that we ask um, when we're assessing the validity of an article. And here they are. They are, uh, were patients randomly assigned to treatment groups? Were baseline characteristics similar at the start of the trial? Were patients blinded to treatment assignment? Were caregivers blinded to treatment assignment? Were outcome assessors blinded to treatment assignment? Were all patients analyzed in the groups to which they were originally randomized? and was follow-up rate adequate? So let's just start by answering the first question. Were patients randomly assigned to treatment groups? And we can see in our article, they had a little section called randomization and masking. And it does say patients were randomly assigned in a one-to-one -one ratio to re receive either walking exercise behavior change intervention or usual care using a computer generated, uh, computer -generated randomization System. So our answer to this question is yes, patients were randomly assigned to treatment groups, so that's good. The next thing we ask is were baseline characteristics similar at the start of the trial? Usually in a journal article, table one will be where you find the baseline characteristics um, and you can compare your groups. So this would be the intervention group and this would be the usual care group, and we have an N or a sample size of 95 in the intervention group, and we have an N or a sample size of 95 in the usual care group. So right there we can see that both groups were similar in actual number of study participants. We can look down and see what the mean age was for the people in the different groups, and we see that the mean age for the people in the intervention group was 67.6, and in the usual care group is 68.2, so that's pretty similar. And we can go down each of the baseline characteristics and see how the groups compare to each other. There's a comparable um, amount of uh, men in the study, there's a comparable amount of women in the study. Um, just keep comparing back and forth to see um, if the baseline characteristics were similar at the start of the trial. This is important because you don't want someone coming in with, um, like if it was a 40 year old with intermittent claudication, maybe they would respond differently to, um, to the treatment. So you, you just wanna make sure that everyone kind of represents the uh, similar um, characteristics. So the next thing we can ask are, uh, is about blinding, um, right? So you want them, you want the patients to be masked to their treatment assignment, you want the caregivers to be masked, um, and you want the outcome assessors to be masked. So you do not want um, any risk of bias to uh, invade your study by somehow someone knowing what group they were assigned to. So in answering this question, we go back to the same place in um, the article, randomization and masking. Um, and we can see that, first of all, were the patients blinded to treatment? Well, they say it was not possible to mask the participants 
or the treating physical therapist to group allocation after randomization because of the nature of the intervention. So in this case, we couldn't actually blind the patients to uh, whether or not they were getting treatment. Now, if we were giving someone a pill, we could either give them a placebo or you know, the actual medication that we're testing. But in the case of physical therapy, patients know whether they're getting physical therapy or not, as well as caregivers, right? The physical therapists, they have to know whether or not they are giving someone physical therapy. So that was not possible to mask those two groups of people. But we did see that the outcome assessor and the trial statistician were masked until after the analyses were complete. So um, one out of three ain't bad. <laughs> So we use this information to kind of guide our judgment of the risk of bias in this particular article. So the next question we ask is, were all patients analyzed in the groups to which they were originally randomized and was the follow-up rate adequate? So we can see, um, usually we see a figure that's kind of like a flow chart of how study participants moved through the research study. Um, and so we see that we started with 524 adults um, with peripheral artery disease from six different vascular clinics. We um, see that we've excluded 140 of those adults. Um, and these are the reasons why each of those participants were excluded from the study. Um, then we were left with 384 and they were screened for eligibility. And then at this point, 194 of them ex were excluded. Um, most of them, most of the ones who were excluded did not meet the inclusion criteria. So we were left with 190 study participants. So these 190 study participants were randomized to the two different groups. So uh, 95 of them were randomized to the walking behavior change group. 95 of them were randomized to the usual care group. And we see how they flowed through the analysis. Um, so we have a three month follow-up testing, and then we also have a six month follow-up testing. So let's talk about why it's important to see whether or not the patients were analyzed in the groups they were originally randomized to. We have something called an intention to treat analysis, which is the opposite of a per protocol analysis. So we have to think about how in research studies, as in life, some patients do not complete a full course of treatment for many reasons. I mean, there's side effects, there's forgetting, or sometimes for no reason at all, people stop uh, pursuing their, the therapy, they stop taking a medication, um, they can't afford it anymore, that's another reason. Um, so we need to know though, do we include the study participants who dropped out along the way in the final analysis? Or do we pretend these participants were never involved in the study and perform our analysis without them? So if we include everybody who started out in the study in the final analysis, that is called an intention to treat analysis, it includes all the participants who were originally randomized to the study in the overall analysis. On the other hand, a per protocol analysis is when you analyze only the study participants that followed the exact protocol of the study. Um, so, so why do we do this? Well, if the point of a randomized controlled trial is to assess treatment effectiveness in real world situations, then intention to treat presents a more valid picture of patient response to treatment, right? Um, if we analyze a treatment per protocol that is without the non-compliant participants, then the treatment may appear to perform better than it actually would in real life. So if a researcher is interested in purely the physiological aspects of a treatment, not the actual effectiveness among real patients, then the per protocol analysis would be appropriate. Um, so a situation where some uh, researchers might want to use a per protocol analysis is uh, to see whether a certain pharmaceutical actually has the effect that they want it to have physiologically um, on, the, on the patient. Um, but if we want to know how patients respond in real life to a medication, an intention to treat analysis would give us more of a complete picture.
So was this study uh, analyzed intention to treat or per protocol? But we can see in the statistical analysis section of the article, um, it says that participants were analyzed according to their assigned randomization group, even if they were non-adherent to their assigned intervention. So um, this would be for the primary analysis. In a different type of analysis, though, they said that it was analyzed according to adherence to the protocol. The per protocol analyses consisted of participants who attended blah, 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 certain things. So in this study, we have kind of two different analyses. We have one of the um, uh, intention to treat and then one aspect of it was per protocol. So after we found our article, it is time to assess the results for effect size and precision. So these are some questions that we ask in assessing the results. So we want to know how large was the treatment effect and how precise was the estimate of the treatment effect. First, how large was the treatment effect? Well, there are certain things we need to consider. Uh, we need to consider the type of outcome that we are looking at in the research study. So outcomes can either be dichotomous or continuous. Um, dichotomous outcomes are yes or no, alive or dead, pregnant or not pregnant, right? It can be either this or that, and it, it can't be both. It can't be a combination of both. Then we have our continuous outcomes, which are continuously measured, right? So we would have blood pressure in millimeters of mercury. Um, another continuous outcome would be age, right? It just keeps on being counted um, higher and higher and higher <laughs> as you go through life. We have weight, um, which also sometimes goes higher and higher throughout life, but we won't talk about that right now. Um, so in this article, we have to figure out whether our outcomes are dichotomous or continuous. Um, so we look and we see um, the primary outcome was six minute walk distance at a three month follow up. So distance would be what kind of an outcome? Is it dichotomous, like a yes or no, an either or, or is it continuous, continuous something that can be continu continually measured? Well, it is continuous. So in that case, all we're looking for is the difference between means. So we're looking for the difference between the mean in the control group and the mean in the treatment group. And here for our primary outcome, which was six minute walk distance um, at baseline and at the three month follow up. Um, we can see that in this group with the walking exercise behavior change intervention, that there was a difference between baseline and three month follow up um, with a within group change. The mean was 22.3 um, meters. So that's an interesting outcome. The usual care group, they also had a change in the means from baseline to three month follow up, um, but their within group change was not quite as high. That one was only 9.2 meters. So we did some statistical adjustments here and we found that um, after statistical adjustments took place, a mean group difference between the two groups the walking exercise behavior change group and the usual care group was 16.7 meters. Now, this sounds great. That's awesome. We got a really good result from the walking exercise behavior change intervention. But we do need to know, is the difference um, statistically significant? And so this is where we look to our p-value. And we want to look to see that the p-value is less than 0 0.05, and that indicates statistical significance. Um, in most studies, that's how we interpret statistical significance. So our p-value for this primary outcome is 0 0.009. So we can say, hey, that is a pretty statistically significant outcome. We also want to know how precise was the estimate of the treatment effect, um, because we do want to know how it's going to affect our patient. Like, did some people just take one more step 
did some people take three miles more? So was it a really wide range of outcomes? Or was it that, wow, almost everybody had a really great score of 10 more steps? Um, so we want to know how precise the estimate of the treatment effect was. And for that, we look at our confidence interval. And we want, you know, usually around a 95% confidence interval. A confidence interval is the range of values consistent with the data that is believed to encompass the actual or true population value. So when we look at our confidence interval, that kind of, that provides a sense of how precise the estimate is. Um, so in the case of a 95% confidence interval, we can be pretty confident that the actual difference between the means between the experimental and control groups, it's believed to fall within that interval in 95 of 100 similar trials. And then finally, we want to assess for applicability to our patients. So the questions that we ask here are, were the study patients similar to my patient? Were all patient important outcomes considered? And are the likely treatment benefits worth the potential harm and cost? So first we'll ask, were the study patients similar to my patient? So we are going to consider the following, biological sex, any comorbidities, race, age, pathology, we wanna look at how severe it was, did it have any distinct characteristics, and um, socioeconomic factors can definitely play a part in uh, patient applicability. So remember, this is our guy, he's a 62-year-old guy with peripheral artery disease with pain walking. And we, we kind of look to see, um, we saw our baseline characteristics earlier, and those were pretty similar to our patient. We would also kind of look in the eligibility criteria um, and see if our patient would have been included in the study, um, or would our patient have been excluded from the study. Uh, we also look to see if all patient important outcomes are considered. In our case, our patient only was concerned about pain with walking. Um, but sometimes patients are concerned about many things, as side effects and cost and ease of, um, ease of using whatever therapy is prescribed to them. Um, in this case, he just cared about pain with walking. And in this study, yes, all of our patient important outcomes were considered. And then we want to look to see whether the likely treatment benefits are worth the potential harm and costs. And so we look to see how the study um, addressed adverse events. And we see that there were some adverse events in here, um, but they say that none of the non-serious adver adverse events were judged to be related to the study. Um, and then they said 16 serious adverse events due to hospitalization were reported by 15 participants, um, but all serious adverse events were judged to either be unrelated or unlikely to be related to the study. Um, so we can say, well, I mean, there are not very serious adverse events that were connected to the study. Um, so for our patient, the likely treatment benefits would probably be worth a potential harm. An interesting thing about this article is that it does have a visual abstract. So these are really cool, uh, give you really kind of concise wrap up of everything that has to do with the article. Um, and we can see what their PICO question was. So their PICO question is, does a physical therapist led home-based walking exercise behavior change intervention improve walking capacity compared to the usual care in adults with peripheral artery disease and intermittent claudication. And that's, that's the pain with walking. Um, and then we have our conclusion right here. Among adults with peripheral artery disease, a home-based walking exercise behavior change intervention compared with usual care increased six-minute walking distance at three months. Um, and we see the results are statistically significant. Um, and they cite their 95% confidence interval, which is an indication of precision. And um, the p-value was less than 0.05, so that's where we get our statistical significance.